Hello, traders. It's Friday, November the 1st. This is John Kickleider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give you a wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade. And more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in these final 24 hours of the trading week. We've rounded out a month. We've come through the end of an enormous amount of high-level event risk and uh, unexpected developments as well. And through all that tumult, it's going to be important that we, uh, we review our bearings and look for where the opportunity opportunities have been uh, motivated, prompted, and where they may have dried up because of that uh, that wave of event risk. And we'll take a look at some of the more interesting uh, areas in the market in today's video. But before we do that, just take 10 seconds to look over the risk disclaimer. And once we're done with that, we can dive right into the conversation. Okay, so we ended out the month of October, all right, and it uh, does so with a, a, a quite a remarkable amount of enthusiasm, although not all as remarkable as what you would see in, in the likes of the U.S. indices. So taking it up to a monthly chart, you can see here an enormous recovery uh, and ultimately a record high close basis on this higher time frame chart. Here for the S&P 500, the Dow a little less uh, aggressive in its in its projection of its strength, but it's still a record high close. Nasdaq as well, making a, a a pretty impressive move, actually a candle that fully encompasses the previous month and again at the same time. Now, of course, we can look at some of these other benchmarks that I like to refer to as a risk basis, and the reason I do this is because the correlation as well as the intensity of a move that seems to orient towards risk on or risk off is much more convincing that it can continue. Not that it's just a one-off or just a happenstance. Let's say something happens in a particular country or a particular asset. Uh, if that is the case, it is less likely to have follow through. But when you have something that is consistent, that is where trends develop. And trends are where opportunity, uh, bigger opportunities arise. So emerging markets, rest of world equities, high yield fixed income or junk bonds, carry trade. All right. We had some risk appetite across the board through the specific month. But how convincing does it look when you look at it on this scale? It doesn't look that convincing at all, in my opinion. Uh, some might uh, see it a different way, but it certainly doesn't have that same kind of mentality or building enthusiasm bubbling beneath the surface that you would presume on something like the S&P 500 or the Dow. It's important to make that distinction because if I were just looking at, let's say the S&P 500 and that were my only measure of risk and let's say Friday or into next week, we have a break to the upside. If I were calling it on a technical basis and a full uh, assumption of sentiment purely from this measure, I would say it has great capacity to follow through because it sticks with the prevailing trend. It is a noteworthy technical break, uh, and it would seem that there is that level of enthusiasm. But when I look at these other risk-based assets, it really cools my appetite for that kind of move. Not that it means that we can't have risk appetite. It's just a, a much more restrained version or requires significantly more uh, motivation or fundamental backing. OK, now taking it back down to something of a lower time frame on this daily. We had a lot of fundamental assumption that was building into this uh, this epic uh, pressure cooker for the S&P 500, really attempting to make uh, a case for the a blow off top uh, or a blow out top uh, for a strong follow through enough of a break that momentum could follow. But we wouldn't get that through Thursday for a number of reasons. But uh, first and foremost, I don't think that the the fundamental backing that got us to this point in the first place was necessarily that reassuring. We had questionable economic backing. The U.S. GDP figure that we had on Wednesday was only moderately encouraging. It was simply just wasn't as bad as expected or slow as expected for the, the quarter. Uh, you had the FOMC rate decision in which uh, the markets initially uh, took 
consternation with the fact that it was a 25 basis point rate rate cut and the assumption was that there was going to be more into the future but the fed wouldn't uh fuel those expectations that was something of a disappointment but the markets eventually garnered some enthusiasm thereafter and of course they tapped into the popular con interest and concerns around trade wars and presumably that the u.s and china's negotiations are still continuing uh, to a fruitful resolution all of that is is the thinnest possible veneer of genuine optimism and enthusiasm, much less does it get to the point of saying, yes, it absolutely justifies a record high price for the markets. So we're, we're dealing more with, with, with enthusiasm, pure confidence, or speculative appetite, in other words. And if there wasn't something else that would really charge us forward, it, it was probably going to uh, destined to struggle. And that's something that I still hold into this new trading month that, that we see and into 2020, frankly. But there was one area where I wanted to see, did it really garner good traction? And that was the tech sector, because we had strong after hours earnings uh, on Wednesday evening for Apple and Facebook, two of the key, t uh, key FANG members, which would in turn insinuate uh, that you're going to get a, a technical lead. So if we were operating purely on, on speculative appetite, rather than some overriding in, in, uh, encouragement of growth or uh, monetary policy lever or trade war uh, optimism, then you would expect the FANG grouping uh, to lead a more productive move higher. Well, here's my FANG index. Uh, it's not equally weighted. They're essentially uh, a, a general weighting to get their prices about equivalent. And as you can see, it has definitely struggled uh, as a benchmark or a leader, whereas historically the FANG index was absolutely leading uh, Certainly the NASDAQ composite was leading the, the S&P 500 by a, a wide margin. And the broader measures, the Wilshire 5000 or the Russell 2000, it was absolutely outpacing to an ex excessive degree. Uh, it was the concentration of uh, this particular index, the tech index, outperforming all the other sectors. And then in turn, those uh, the U.S. equity markets as a benchmark outperforming most other counterparts, global indices, as well as other asset classes all together. So it was a great opportunity for this to be, to take control, to take the reins, so to speak, on sentiment. But as you can see, we got a little bit of a, a break to the upside, not much in the way of follow through. Facebook, Apple, the motivation didn't show in these shares post earnings, so active trade on Thursday, and that would underwhelm uh, for the NASDAQ. This is the NASDAQ 100. Now the NASDAQ as a ratio to the S&P 500, the broader index, you can see that that ratio would not rise. So the typical driver or leader in speculative appetite was not in full form. This doesn't have to be the only uh, front-running catalyst. There can certainly shift in interest and influence, but that doesn't seem to be happening. The S&P 500 as a ratio relative to its global counterparts, S&P 500 relative to the VEU, you can see that that didn't garner any meaningful traction either. So it was a disappointment in sentiment and fundamentals were never the reliable backing for this kind of movement, this motivation. Now, we have passed the data, the core opportunities, the, the tangible opportunities to actually spark a little bit more enthusiasm, which uh, means that we have to open ourselves back up to the uncertainties of the market. And it's going to be up to speculative appetite itself to maintain its own buoyancy. That's a little bit more difficult to do when you're looking at something like the S&P 500 pushing records. Or when you're looking at something like the Emerging Market ETF, where it's attempting a break, it's struggling to find follow through, that is perhaps even more uh, problematic to maintain uh, a degree of bullishness. Because it insinuates we have the technical break, we should have a textbook follow through according to our, our norms uh, of, uh, of, uh, of charting analysis, and yet it's not coming. So those that were enthusiastic to participate in the initial break are probably going to fall apart in terms of conviction behind it. All right. Now I'm taking a look at uh, the norms, the historical averages 
of market performance uh, when it comes to the S&P 500, uh, the, my, my favorite benchmark at risk trends, as I often say, uh, as well as the volume, so the level of activity. October is usually a bullish month. We ended up uh, uh, witnessing that. It's also, uh, on average, the most uh, voluminous, so you have the most volume. That was not the case. There was, in fact, a, a significant deflation in, vo in volume, which is insinuating, insinuating further that there is not a lot of conviction to be found here. But in the next two months, November, December, are strong, positive, leaning months historically for this index as volume starts to drop off. Squeezing out liquidity is going to be a problem if we cannot maintain pure speculative lift or uh, otherwise get fundamental backing behind it. Looking at the risk or the volatility, historically the volatility uh, peaks in October and it starts to deflate through November as the holidays start to kick in. Taking a look at the volatility index, we are already exceptionally low. Is it just going to be a further deflation into the end of the year and just uh, meander until liquidity restores in uh, January? Uh, I doubt it, uh, but it does mean that you're, you're probably going to struggle for pure speculative momentum, and we have to abide by more of these fundamental themes when they do arise, which can be problematic because it's not all scheduled event risk. This is the kind of conditions that we're dealing. How do you deal with that? Well, you should expect uh, shorter bursts, greater bursts of volatility in markets uh, and uh, see for a struggle a fall through. It's more likely also that the prevailing trend, the S&P 500 bullish uh, or risk on, is it going to be more difficult to promote momentum than the alternative. If volatility and thin liquidity are uh, key backdrop conditions, then sharp movements to the downside, risk aversion, that don't necessarily commit to a full tilt bear trend are more likely to garner traction. Not more probable, but they will uh, be more fruitful in terms of movement. All right, so this is what we're expecting, uh, what we're looking towards going into November trade. But in the meantime, those fundamental themes must keep active uh, active op observation on them. Uh, so the trade war progress seemed to be a a highlight in the headlines um, between the United States and China, especially reinforcing some of the disappointment with the FOMC rate decision on Wednesday afternoon evening. Uh, well, that started to degrade, certainly this past session. Why? There were reports that China was doubting the, the United States' willingness to commit to the long-term deal uh, on their trade in the phase one. Uh, Trump suggested you know, or remarked himself that he's working on uh, a new site uh, for signing off on a phase one. They were 60% of the way through the deal. Uh, but it was also suggested that China was supposedly demanding an end to tariffs if they were going to uh, move forward with a phase two deal, which is most likely a non-starter. Someone has to capitulate here, and both of these countries have little interest and little uh, historical reference to suggest that they, they will be the ones. All right. Trade wars, the loose enthusiasm that this would encourage, this is the USDCNH, uh, is certainly uh, backing off, especially considering that the United States and China have reportedly been on uh, the verge of improvement, and we've seen it fall apart multiple times before. That is problematic. So this is not really a confidence-inspiring uh, theme to back something like the S&P 500 pushing record highs. It's not even really that uh, reliable uh, for spurring a little bit more optimism and movement from the likes of the emerging markets or even from the USDCNH reversal. So be mindful of what to expect from that. In the meantime, we were watching GDP as a carryover of Wednesday session into Thursday. Wednesday had the U.S. GDP figure, the French GDP figure, uh, and those were not particularly inspiring. Uh, they were slightly better than expected. But uh, carrying through into this past session, uh, we would focus on the Hong Kong GDP figures, which 
we already officially, well, unofficially knew what they were going to uh, play out to be. That's because the Hong Kong uh, secretary had suggested that they had already tipped into recession. That was just confirmed in this figure. The Eurozone GDP figures were, I guess, better than expected. Expectations were for 0.1% growth in the quarter. is 0.2, but that is a very... Uh, mediocre figure, especially for a region that is very concerned about the external circumstances, uh, dealing with issues like Brexit and trade wars with the United States potentially, uh, and seeing some of its, its largest members flirt with possible recession, like Germany. So this did not carry the wealth of enthusiasm that we would expect from something like the DAX or something like the Euro even. So it certainly wouldn't uh, escalate to the uh, outer sphere of sentiment, the leader of sentiment in the S&P 500. Now, other interesting GDP-oriented updates came from the likes of the uh, Chinese PMIs. Uh, those Chinese PMIs, this is actually the government figures, were broadly disappointing. The composite was 52, falling 53.1 reading. The manufacturing, which is still their bread and butter, dropped from 49.8 to 49.3. That is, if you want to look at it that way, that is a recession measure for the manufacturing sector, which is very disconcerting, but not new. We've seen this uh, actually as the case before. We also saw an interesting Canadian figure. Uh, so the Canadian GDP figures were uh, more or less in line with expectations, not really building up on uh, the opportunity to see the dollar CAD or the CAD yen extend significantly momentum purely on the Canadian dollar basis. This Canadian dollar move started because of the Bank of Canada, uh, lowered its growth forecast and started to uh, uh, talk with a little bit more of a, a dovish uh, a dovish view. But we did not see necessarily that take place. But as you can see here, actually from the, the CAD yen, there was some significant movement in the yen crosses purely. Now, if you're looking at the uh, risk sentiment, uh, there was pullback across these variety of assets that we've been looking at, but I thought the most interesting was actually the yen crosses. Uh, dollar yen, the dollar was still underperforming. It was still meandering. You can see here the DXY is pushing the floor here. Uh, and with the likes of the dollar yen, you actually had a pullback from range high. This is a particularly interesting technical pattern, in, in my opinion. I was also watching it as a possible break higher if risk appetite can hold out or actually get a, a significant escalation, uh, or if the dollar could really charge forward, uh, which is difficult to do, always going to be difficult to do, but this combination presents another very interesting opportunity. But since we're here on the dollar, uh, we did have some disappointment from the Chicago MNI business barometer, the lowest, I think, since 2015. Uh, there was uh, expectations or discussion about ramping up a 2020 uh, tax cut proposal, which didn't get a lot of traction. And we are heading into Friday non farm payrolls, although I don't put my expectations very high. The best potential this may have is to be particularly weak showing of overall employment trends, which could in turn leverage the probability that the Fed ramps up its uh, probability of a December rate cut, which they still stated that, stated that they're very uh, dubious of, but it could continue uh, to depress the dollar. Alternatively, a robust figure is probably going to be overlooked because it's not as important as the other fundamental themes that we've been dealing with the rest of this week. All right, so there's a skew in potential here. Now, this being said, uh, I do like that dollar yen move. All right, so I move into range, but I am holding it up against a couple other uh, dollar-based crosses. Most people like the Euro USD, all right, because it is moving to the extremes of its range. A, a reversal here would be encouraging, but that would require a dollar recovery. So this might be a better opportunity if indeed the dollar regains some traction. I actually asked uh, people not long before I started here, 55 uh, votes so far, but which currency cross, which of these dollar pairs that I mentioned here were their favorite? Uh, and it was the Euro USD that topped them. All right, 42%. Dollar Yen was second, 29%. Uh, Aussie USD, 22%. And 7% was the dollar peso. Actually, that tends to follow the, uh, I think, the general awareness of those pairs. And that's what I want to I draw attention to. Euro USD might look good, but it's not even near the extremes of those uh, technical boundaries. 
So consider something like the dollar yen uh, or the Aussie USD, if you really want a dollar rebound and there's questions about the progress of trade wars, Aussie USD is perhaps better suited for this, the Australian dollar, holding a, a greater exposure to the uh, Chinese uh, economic health. My preference, if it's a dollar rebound, though, is really dollar Mexican peso. Uh, and this is a much more robust technical picture. The Mexican peso uh, rises and falls relative to the U.S. given their uh, North American economic connection, their trade war implications directly from the USMCA. Uh, and the economy in Mexico has certainly shown uh, some struggle. So there's some, some solid fundamental uh, backing behind what is a f very uh, remarkable technical pattern. So, and this is definitely the path least resistance kind of uh, perspective. So this is kind of uh, my leading preference. I definitely like the dollar yen for a shorter basis, Aussie USD for technical fundamental, and Euro USD is actually uh, further into the rear of what I consider the best options. But remember, keep open a dollar bullish and bearish view. Uh, there's good reason for both of them. But as it stands with risk trends, as we go into Friday, non-farm payrolls can perhaps tease a little bit of risk trends, uh, but I don't think that it's going to be a particularly profound motivator, especially for a break to the upside. Something else may happen and provide some greater lift, uh, but it will be something of a struggle. All right. If there's a pullback in risk trends purely from a deflating of that uh, previously earned buoyancy, that would probably be more productive. If that's the case and you're looking at a dollar pair again, uh, the dollar yen or the Aussie USD are better suited for something along those lines because they can position the dollars as safe haven. But there are plenty of other crosses that have better context for risk aversion and not have the complication of the uh, U.S. Uh, fundamental perspective, which is getting more and more complicated. Uh, maybe even a Euro Aussie, which is uh, unusual, but very technically appealing. All right. Now, the last thing I want to look at uh, is gold. Uh, now, I, I've said this many times before, this is a fantastic barometer of not just safe uh, or risk aversion, risk appetite, uh, but it takes on an additional feature of being a reflection of financial stability. Uh, so as it rises, this risk aversion with the added influence of financial concern related to things like the ineffectiveness of monetary policy, which is a big issue for me, a big theme in my mind. Here it is, uh, gold uh, priced in equally in all the uh, dollar main euro pound yen majors uh, and as you can see it jogged higher this past session all right so a little bit of risk aversion certainly would support this kind of move but i think this is more unique to what gold represents so keep tabs on this all right we'll wrap it up here we'll do our next and final video for the week tomorrow until then i wish you all good luck trading out there